Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Wednesday, August 17th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, the pursuit for justice against Hillary continues as members of the House Oversight Committee and Judiciary Committee pursue perjury charges against crooked Hillary. Meanwhile, a recent study by Stanford University proves that Hillary Clinton's campaign rigged the system to steal the nomination from Bernie Sanders. If the Clintons would steal the election from Bernie Sanders, the nomination, as the DNC WikiLeaks proved they did, why would they not steal the election from Donald Trump if they can? Plus, child cruelty and the Olympics. Has China gone too far? All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. House Republicans are set to pursue perjury charges against Hillary Clinton. And now these are members of the House Oversight Committee and Judiciary Committee. They are pressing the DOJ to act on evidence showing that Hillary willfully lied during her sworn testimony uh, during an October 22nd, 2015 interrogation regarding the Benghazi debacle in which she was also, uh, she also answered some questions concerning her illegal private email server. A video uploaded to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform YouTube channel asks, were Hillary Clinton's statements false? And so there's only one server, is that what you're telling me? And it's the one server that the FBI has? The FBI has the server that was used during the tenure of my uh, State Department service. Secretary Clinton used several different servers and administrators of those servers during her four years at the State Department. I provided all of my work-related emails, uh, all that I had. The FBI also discovered several thousand work-related emails that were not among the group of 30,000 emails. So that's a three minute video. We could only show you 30 seconds of it. So it goes on and on. It's pretty much an open shut case, the perjury deal there. Now speaking to Fox News, retired assistant FBI director Stephen Pomerantz said a decision to pursue perjury charges given the weight of the evidence could you know, take a mere weeks. He said a violation of 18 USC 1621 can lead to a fine, imprisonment of up to five years or both. Though legal experts said the crux of the case will rely on showing intent. And we know how she's gotten off in the past on showing intent. But it speaks volumes when a top surrogate for Hillary Clinton cannot even confirm the candidate's honesty. Now, this was New Hampshire Governor Maggie Hassan. Uh, she dodged the question three times in an interview with CNN's Manu Raju. Do you think that she's honest and trustworthy? I support Hillary Clinton for the presidency because her experience and her record demonstrate that she's qualified to hold the job. You think she's honest? She has um, a critical, um, critical plan, among others, uh, for making college more affordable. But do you think that she's trustworthy? I think that she has demonstrated a commitment always to something beyond herself, bigger than herself. And Clinton's supporters are gonna have to dodge this question of her honesty even further because now she's come out repeatedly against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, even though just last year she called it the gold standard. Well, also now they're gonna have to deal with the fact that Hillary Clinton appointed Tuesday former Se uh, Senator and Interior Secretary Ken Salazar to head her transition team. But he, Salazar was a paid lobbyist for the TPP, and he remains an outspoken supporter of the deal. In an op-ed in USA Today, Salazar called the TPP the greenest trade deal ever and claimed that it would help middle-class families get ahead. Salazar's law firm also lobbied on behalf of the global corporations to give Obama extra constitutional fast track power to push TPP through Congress. So she picks a pro TPP globalist. Of course, now the TPP has become a central issue for this presidential election. And this is gonna be another one of those flip flops here after or if she gets elected. Now, speaking of intent, WikiLeaks is now trying to use the Clinton precedent requiring the DOJ to drop the case against Assange. Now, this was in a letter to the U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch on Tuesday. Lawyers representing WikiLeaks argued that the case against their client should be dropped in light of the Clinton precedent. They argued that the ongoing investigation into Assange and WikiLeaks 
which was first announced by the DOJ in 2010, not only violates rules designed to protect news organizations, but should be outright dropped in light of Clinton's email case. The department publicly announced that it was closing its criminal investigation of the handling of classified information by Hillary Clinton. Uh, James Comey made it clear that his conclusion was based on the necessity of proving criminal intent. Now, uh, Julian Assange, who's been in the Ecuadorian embassy for exactly four years, has not demonstrated criminal intent during news gathering and reporting activities. They argued that criminal prosecution is appropriate only when a person was knowingly violating the law and was intending to aid enemies of the U.S. or was attempting to obstruct justice. WikiLeaks has continually said that their intentions have been rooted in the belief that its content is newsworthy, and that's proven by widespread and extensive third-party media coverage. Hmm, what a tangled web they have woven over at the Department of Justice. So now people are calling them out on that, saying, hey, if you're going to let Hillary walk, you got to let a lot of other people walk as well. So this is interesting, holding their feet to the fire. Well, now we have another blow to one of Obama's legacies. Uh, the, one of the largest health insurers, Aetna, has announced that it is dropping Obamacare insurance in 69 percent of the counties and 11 of 15 states where it currently offers plans. So they're the third largest health insurance company, and they're just the latest to pull back from the plans that are being offered under the Affordable Care Act. So this cut is gonna affect 20% of Aetna's Obamacare participants. And for those of you who are paying this monthly premium, experts are forecasting that the premium for an average plan is expected to rise by 9% in 2017 to a monthly payment of 281. So that's just $281 for the average plan. <laughs> a premium every month for just your average plan. My goodness. But, you know, not to be deterred, Obama is hoping for another legacy before he leaves office. He is going to be handing over American control of the internet to an international group in just two months. Talk about convenient timing. The Obama administration is dead set on handing over American control of the internet in just under two months. The Department of Commerce will finalize the transition effective October 1st. The move means that the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, which is responsible for assigning IP addresses, will move from U.S. control to the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. This is a multi-stakeholder body based in Los Angeles that includes countries such as China and Russia. Critics of the move have pointed out that the agency could be used by totalitarian governments to shut down the web around the globe. Washington Examiner reports that opponents have made the case that Congress has passed legislation to prohibit the federal government from using tax dollars to allow this transition. They point out that the feds are constitutionally prohibited from transferring federal property without approval from Congress. A coalition of 25 advocacy groups have issued a separate statement calling for Congress to sue in the event the transfer moves forward. Well, we sure are learning a lot from those some 2,500 stolen memos from George Soros's nonprofit network, the Open Society Foundation. There was a huge hack attack that took place this weekend. And one of the memos revealed that Soros's investments led to the Senate passage Gang of Eight immigration bill. This is, of course, according to the group. And so now we're finding that in the future, they may embark on a massive campaign on immigration issues in the near future. The Soros group believes its $7.7 million investment in groups pushing for immigration reform was responsible for the passage of that comprehensive immigration reform bill. This measure was quashed by House Republicans, but Soros's group believes that the, uh, these pro-immigration groups were made stronger because of the investment in activists, alliances, infrastructure, and media outreach. So this for them is not about the battle, it's about the war, they're in this for the long game. So this was you know, a few years ago, and they're expecting that because of that investment that they made, we can expect massive immigration reform campaigns in the future. And to achieve this, the uh, Soros's network um, has authorized the creation of the Immigration Innovation Fund. Uh, he's committed $15 million over the course of three years to fund this initiative. So he also spotted an opportunity in the wake of President Obama's first am amnesty executive action. Uh, this was the DACA that was going on in June 2012. Uh, the OSF mobilized to form a coalition of activist group and labor unions 
operating under the name Alliance for Citizenship. There was $4.7 million given to the group through April 2014. And that spending is integral to getting immigration reform passed in the Senate. So here we have George Soros with his fingers in everything there. Uh, the hackers have also revealed that Soros has been funding research of critics of Islam. Um, so this is him using his nonprofits funding uh, opposition research, critics of radical Islam, and they also wanted to discredit the Israeli government. Um, this was once again, the Open Society Foundation. They gave $200,000 to the Center for American Progress, of course, a liberal think tank. They gave that money to them to conduct high quality opposition research to fight against anti-Muslim xenophobia and to promote tolerance. Right. Much like the tolerance that we see, which is silencing critics, kicking conservatives off of Twitter, uh, rejecting you off of Facebook. Of course, we had that recording of uh, Angela Merkel talking there with uh, Zuckerberg of Facebook, threatening arrest and anyone making any disparaging comments. So that's their idea of tolerance, funding opposition research. And of course, we also knew that he was funding the Black Lives Matter movement, but these memos reveal it was $650,000 given to Black Lives Matter. Open Society Institute viewed the 2015 Baltimore unrest following the death of Freddie Gray as an opening, uh, a unique opportunity to create accountability for the Baltimore police while aiding activists in reforming the city. So that's what they 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 say that it's under the guise of you know, helping out the people and police reform. And so that's why they've really got to push this narrative that cops are just killing people and it's so dangerous because this is part of the UN agenda to get the police under federal control so that they can then be put under a global police force. That is a whole initiative here. And so that's why we're seeing him with his fingers and everything with this civil unrest. My guest today is Colin Flaherty. Now, he is the award winning reporter and author of the number one best selling book, Don't Make the Black Kids Angry The Hoax of Black Victimization and Those Who Enable It. He's also the author of White Girl Bleed a Lot The Return of Racial Violence to America and How the Media Ignore It. Now, both these books are about black mob violence, black on white crime, and how public officials, reporters, and activists deny, excuse, condone, and encourage them. Colin, thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh, great to be back. So what do you think about what's happening here? We're learning with these leaks with George Soros and these other globalist groups kind of getting their tentacles in, supporting these groups that are causing unrest around the country. And then we are witnessing uh, on our own end how the media isn't really talking about what's actually going on. And in fact, they're pushing out this narrative that cops are just willy nilly killing black people for no reason at all. And of course, this is going to enable this uh, reform of policing. Yeah, I think I think you're 100 percent correct on that. You know, I, I, I follow Black Lives Matter as closely as anybody. When they kind of burst on the scene, the first thing that was immediately apparent is they were spending a lot of money. I mean, there were, there were lots and lots of plane rides. There's lots and lots of you know trips to the White House. Uh, there's lots of you know media consulting going on. I never saw so until... You know, until I saw that report that you were talking about, it was never clear to me where the money was coming from, but uh, lots of conferences. So somebody's uh, very interested in in helping them take their message of denial, deceit and delusion about this level of black criminality and how the cops are always picking on black people for no reason whatsoever. Somebody's very, very eager to help them with that message. Right, exactly. I mean, even Milwaukee, for instance, we had uh, five people shot the night before uh, Seville Smith was shot. There were no riots there. Of course, 52 people killed in Chicago alone that same weekend. No riots there. But we don't want to talk about that. We can't talk about this crime that is now sort of uh, crossing the boundaries and leaking out into the suburbs, as we saw uh, the sister there of this man who was shot and killed saying, take that to the suburbs. Um, so do you think this is smart for the media um, and politicians to ignore this festering boil? You know, I don't know why they ignore it. I just document over and over and over how they ignore it. Like you mentioned uh, the CN, you mentioned their story about the sister saying, take it out to the suburbs. Well, in the single greatest act of media deceit I have ever seen, CNN re-edited that speech where the sister of the dead guy in Milwaukee is saying, go to the suburbs, burn the suburbs down. The CNN, they put a graphic up saying, 
you know, Guy's sister calls for peace and they edited her, edited her remarks to make it sound like she was calling for peace when she was calling for riots. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I actually put it up on my YouTube channel. I think you guys did something on it too. Right. It's major deception across the board. Of course, it's not just with the African-American community, but we're also seeing them refuse to cover cartel activity that is coming across the border. And of course, making excuses, for instance, for the refugees who raped a five-year-old girl in Twin Falls, Idaho. We even had the politicians there coming out and elected officials saying that they were going to arrest anyone who would dare speak to the media, speak illy about these refugees. Uh, you know, we're seeing that in other countries as well. This is setting a very dangerous precedent. Uh, now stay right there because we are going to take a break. And when we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit more specifically about your books and how they uh, are. It's really kind of playing out in the media presently. So we'll be right back. And welcome back. Now, I've been speaking with Colin Flaherty. He is the award-winning reporter and author of a number one best-selling book, Don't Make the Black Kids Angry, The Hoax of Black Victimization and Those Who Enable It. We've been talking a lot about uh, how reporters, public officials, activists are denying and excusing a lot of the violence that we've been in, uh, seeing taking place across the country at least since Ferguson uh, in Baltimore, Milwaukee, a lot of states now it's, it's festering up and kind of getting to the, the question of, is this really the proper way to have a discussion about race? I feel like this is a dangerous precedent to set. It's not only harming the black community there, but also people who might not even be aware that there's any issues, for instance, with a knockout game, telling people it's just an isolated incident. You know, when you talk about having a conversation about race, I, I call I call this uh, epidemic of vi racial violence and denial the greatest hoax of our lifetime. And, and part of that hoax is a, a smaller lie, which is when people say we need to have a conversation about race. I, 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 I compile a list of people and I added to it yesterday in Baltimore, a police lieutenant, people who are fired or suspended from their jobs because they tell the truth about racial violence. Yesterday, a police lieutenant in Baltimore called Black Lives Matter a bunch of thugs. He gets suspended for telling the truth. So there's a lot of that going on out there. And that's why, you know, that's what I do. I just do the, I just expose the violence, denial, violence, denial. There's so much going on out there. You know, you know, you were talking about Milwaukee. There's so many cities where people go, Milwaukee's like that? I mean, there's right. an enormous amount of, of black criminality and violence in Milwaukee. I remember a couple of years ago at the Wisconsin State Fair in Milwaukee, there were hundreds of black people inside, outside the fair, rampaging through, beating up white people. It was all on 911 calls, which I put on my YouTube channel. So you hear all these people going, hey, these black people just beat the hell out of my mom. You know, when your mom's getting beat up, you're not going to sit there and pretend it's anything other than what it is. And, and so there's all these cities. I mean, forget, forget Detroit, Chicago, Baltimore, Washington. What about Milwaukee? What about a couple days ago, Cedar Rapids? 100 to 200 black people rampaged through the sweet corn festival in Cedar Rapids, shut it down. They attacked police. Uh, I, I don't, you know, so much of this going on, and there's so little, little of it being reported outside of myself and a couple other people. Right. I know the, the article that you have uh, at The American Thinker actually points out how there was just one um, outlet that actually reported it in that way uh, about these people rampaging through this state fair. Most of them took the tack of like, oh, these silly kids, they ruin the fair for everyone. What was the what was the in the local media? They came up with a new phrase. I've heard all the phrases, unruly teenagers, whatever. They called them reckless children. Right. They were the ones responsible. This was an episode of large scale black mob violence in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Not the first one. So my question to you, Leanne, is if this is happening in Cedar Rapids. What do you think is happening in the rest of the country? Right. And that's, you know, something that you've also pointed out is that they, they are really just pushing this narrative uh, that there's a war on black people and it's being the cops are the main uh, predators there while the media is ignoring this tsunami of black violence against cops and actually not going to the police officers themselves and saying, you know, what are you having to deal with on a daily basis? Why is this so dangerous for you? And then, of course, there is the whole issue of the statistics that are completely uh, irrelevant. You know, the cops, cops in this country are victims of racial violence, harassment, 
uh, and even murder on a daily basis from black people. When a cop rolls into a black neighborhood, it's the, the amount of abuse they get is enormous. But you turn on a TV or pick up a newspaper and, and you read the opposite, that somehow black people are always the victims of white racism. I mean, I mean Dem Hillary and Bernie just spent the last year you know, that's all they talked. That was 20 to 25 percent of what they talked about in their debates in public forums, white racism. So this is the greatest lie of our generation. That's the bad news. The good news is because of people like you and Alex and YouTube, lots and lots of people are seeing the enormous difference between what is said in their mainstream media and what really happened. And, and, and I think we're picking up a lot of that now. Right. And, you know, going back to these statistics a little bit, obviously, we know on the one hand, they're skewed because police officers aren't even required to um, keep record of people who are killed. A lot. I know states like Florida, they're not even required to do that. But at the same time, we also know there is the whole snitches get stitches epidemic. And so people aren't even reporting instances of crime when it's happening in their own communities. I mean, Chicago, perfect example. People are actually shooting children at barbecues and picnics and things, and then the families are so afraid or they don't want to work with the police, they don't even go after someone who's actually killed their child. So there's that whole uh, thing of sort of protecting the community and not being a snitch. So we don't even know what the real crime yeah. statistics are. See, see, that's exactly right, because uh, we know that they're bad. We know that black criminality is wildly out of proportion when compared to white and Asian criminality. We know black on white crime is way greater than white on black. Okay, the numbers are really bad, whatever they are. But then you throw in stitches for snitches. What about witness intimidation? And the D district attorney in Philadelphia and Baltimore and in Milwaukee, they all say that every shooting they get, it's involved, it, witness intimidation is involved. The guy who died, oh, by the way, the guy who died in Milwaukee, he was busted for witness intimidation six months ago in a shooting. So... We don't, you know, and then there's such a thing called Bronx juries where black ju black juries tend not to convict black defendants. As bad as the black crime problem is in America, statistically, it's actually way worse for the reasons you just gave. Right. And that's where I think that not being truthful with reporting and p protecting uh, the so-called class, because maybe you you think it's less racist of you to not be truthful in your reporting. I personally think that that's absolutely racist. There's plenty of black people out there that can look at the news objectively and say that has nothing to do with me. Uh, I mean, it seems as though we've seen, you know, many, many decades ago, black families were doing really well, uh, good income, good education. They were, there were many accomplishments. Something happened. Now we're seeing um, this sort of welfare. They're only pushing out the sort of ghetto culture, the hip hop culture. Perfect example, Dr. Ben Carson was like right there neck and neck with Donald Trump. And the black community kind of said, well, he doesn't represent us because he doesn't know the this particular rap lyric. And I'm like, are you kidding? He literally started from the bottom and now he is a multimillionaire neurosurgeon. Why why doesn't he represent the black community? So what what happened? And I think, you know, Milwaukee's perfect example, a Democrat run city for more than 100 years. It's this divide and conquer of white versus black where they want to take it to the suburbs. But your average white person isn't the one that's setting up these policies, keeping these people down. You know, the, so the reporters, so I always write about two things. I write about the violence and I write about how the media covers it. So but I, sometimes I think the reporters are overplaying their hand. Like I remember during Ferguson, I did a lot of stories on this. You'd have these people running down the street, throwing Molotov cocktails, shooting at cops. And then the reporters, that would be the B-roll. Then the reporters are looking into the camera and telling you that the protest was largely peaceful. And everybody at home is going, that's not largely peaceful. So I think they're overplaying their hand. And you can tell that in you know, all these newspapers that are going out of business, the New York Daily News, you can't even sell it. Nobody will even buy that. They sold Newsweek for a dollar. So I think that these guys are losing, you know, it's funny, they're losing their audience, but their reaction to losing their audience is doubling down on what caused them to lose their audience in the first place. Right, exactly. Excusing the mob violence that's happening, saying that riots are the voice of the unheard, which, of course, Martin Luther King famously said. But that's, you know, that's like a totally different story here because they're rioting over their criminal 
uh, buddies, not over the fact that they are the reason why they're being held down is because of these terrible policies that have been put in place, controlling their cities, keeping them down. You know, it's hard for a lot of people to get their minds around the fact that people who run these chocolate cities like Baltimore, Memphis, New Orleans, other places, the criminals are more popular than the crops. So when they look at a when they look at a, a black criminal, they don't see a criminal. They see a victim of white racism. And I mean, Stephanie Rawlings was a great example last year when she said we're going to give the rioters space to destroy. We see a lot of that. New Orleans, Memphis. There's so much. I mean, every, I mean, it's all about black victimization, which is the greatest hoax of our lifetime. Exactly. And of course, as long as you see yourself as a victim, you can never rise above and become a conqueror. That's the truth, isn't it? Yeah. Colin Flaherty, thank it. you so much for joining us today. ColinFlaherty.com. We'll be sure to have you back on the show soon. Cars way over there. Got the look at all the cars. People are still coming in to see Donald Trump. That is truly amazing. You really can't get a grasp of it till you walk through it all. I didn't even make it to the end of the parking lot. I got Hillary for prison right here. See her behind bars. I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far. Guys, I got one question for you. We've seen these polls come out where Hillary's leading by 15, 20 points now. It's just absurd. And you look at the crowd sizes between Hillary's crowds and Trump's crowds. What do you think is behind all this poll chicanery? And what do you think of the true size uh, of Hillary's support really is? Well, it's it's all uh, media. Uh, you know, I was watching a, a bit of a Hillary thing. If you look at the crowd, it's very small. It's very drawn in. There's maybe a, a hundred people there, and they draw it in to make it look big. Look at the people that are around here. I mean, you got thousands and thousands of people. Every time Trump goes someplace, it's overflow. This is a Hillary rally. We'd maybe see like what this many. I, I think it might be the handicap would fill in, and then we'd have probably the first couple of rows, and that would probably that would probably be about it. I would think. Like a large PTA meeting. It, similar, yeah. Some some government oriented, uh, you know, gathering of, of architects and engineers. <laughs> Ready to tell us how to live. Exactly, yeah. exactly. What do you think about all these polls that are coming out showing Trump? Fake. 15, Hillary 20 points real. behind Hillary Clinton. Fake. 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 How could that be fake? It's done by reputable news institutions. Now, what? You think they're colluding with Hillary Clinton's campaign? Absolutely. Oh. I, I want true media. Yeah. I, that's why I watch your show all the time. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, right from the internet. You can check Twitter numbers, you can check read it numbers. All of them. Trump is like double what Hillary is. Look at this place. We're in the middle of a cornfield. I would say those polls are fixed. That's just my opinion. That's your opinion? Yeah. And why would the media be interested in pushing those types of numbers like that over and over again? Which media are we talking about? Well, like three media? Exactly. Like CNN, MSNBC? Well, it's pretty easy to understand why, because they pretty much lean towards the left. So I can understand why they would BS those numbers. Pretty easy to figure that one out. I think they're so inaccurate, it's not even funny, especially when you're talking mainstream media polls. And, and most of them are, you know, you're talking about independent polls, then you'll see some different numbers. Fixed uh, in favor for Hillary. In favor for Hillary. So you think Hillary is cheating? I think there are a lot of questions and things that um, haven't gone um, according to the way that they should, according to the laws. You guys think the polls are accurate these days? No. Why? Because they're slanted. Well, now, who's slanting them? Why are they being slanted? Why are they being slanted? Because the media's been that way all along. Uh, it's a combination of every form of scheming and contrived, you know, um, what is it, uh, statistics. I mean, that's all it is. It's just made up, made up garbage because you look out here. This is Wisconsin, too. This is a liberal state. In a, he didn't even win the state. No, but this shows us that the people are ready for an alpha male to lead the country again and not some limp-wristed guy who goes on vacation for, you know, three quarters of the time that he's president. So obviously you support Hillary not being in the presidency. <laughs> That's right. She's, I, I used to be in the military and the things that she did with the uh, uh, email server, well, I mean, one email that I would have uh, taken out of a classified area, I would have been in jail for making big rocks into small rocks. So this is just ridiculous what she did. 
Everyone who comes out to this rally, that's a great step. Everybody who goes and votes for Trump, an even better step. But you want to make a difference? You make a difference every day by looking at the label. Check your label, buy American. If we stay locked in like what Donald's ideas are in terms of monitoring the polls, the exit polls also. So I think with that, that may be one of the advantages we might have, being able to try to curtail that crooked system that they have in place. Um, I really don't know very many Hillary supporters. I know a lot more uh, Sanders supporters. I think the whole election was rigged uh, to give it to Hillary with the superdelegates and things like that. Well, but you know what? Anybody who votes for Hillary has got to have their head examined. Do you think that uh, Hillary co-founded ISIS with Obama? 100% yes. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now we're at Sherman Park where just a few days ago, violence erupted after a officer involved shooting. And behind us is the BP station that was burned down to the ground, much like the quick trip that we saw in Ferguson. And I'm joined with a special agent, his name's Joel out of the ATF. Uh, tell us about what's going on. Uh, what are you guys are trying to do today? And what do you know so far? Well, uh, we have a, a team of arson and explosives professionals that we have assembled from all across the United States and they are here to fact find. So we are working a joint investigation with the Wisconsin um, Department of uh, Corrections investigation, um, the Milwaukee Fire Department, the Milwaukee Police Department, um, along with the ATF and we are all gathering facts so that um, we can get a better understanding of the exacts of what happened. So this team that, that you see here, um, this is our national response team. And um, they respond to large-scale commercial arsons and explosives incidents all across the United States. So at this point in time, do you guys have a uh, possible suspect or suspects that, you, that you're looking at for this? Is that what you're kind of looking for? The, who did it? You're trying to salvage any kind of footage or anything like that from surrounding areas? Well, what we have is a, a open-ended investigation. So um, to answer your question, we're trying to develop all of those things. Um, so. Um, along with the science, um, you know, we're also trying to get and gather human intelligence as well. So any, any kind of uh, videos or, or um, eyewitness um, testimony that anybody might have, um, you know, so we're, we're actually looking towards or looking to the community to, to help us out with anything that they may have seen. Um, because this is a huge puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, if you would. And we are putting all the police pieces in place um, so that we have a clear picture of what actually happened. Now, have you had a lot of the, uh, the locals come out and kind of come forward with evidence? Have they been very helpful at all? Or have people been a little bit more apprehensive right now just because it's a couple of days, it's still pretty fresh and people don't really want to talk? Right. It's, it's still pretty fresh and, um, you know, and feelings are raw, but um, the community uh, here today has been, has been wonderful. The, everybody's been very cooperative and, um, and we're, still, we're still asking, you know, so, um, you know, that's one thing that, um, you know, a lot of people may not know that we actually, we need, we need their help. And so we're asking if you saw something, if you know something about this, to please give us a call. Um, we have uh, the ATF, we have a Twitter feed, um, and we have uh, Twitter, we have Facebook. Um, I, I guess I'm you know, telling my age because I'm not sure how many uh, social media things we, yeah. Yeah, we actually have. So uh, you know, I'd probably have to ask your young cameraman here what, you know, what, what all we have, but we have a lot of social media at, at ATF. So, so, is, so is, this, is this a typical response though? Now say if you know the riots popped off and say if it was just a house that was burnt down, would the same kind of response happen? Or is this because this is BP 
a gas station involved with a pretty big company, is that why there's a response for something like this? Would it be any difference if this were, say, a house right here? Well, you know, a, a lot of that would be dependent on the scale because, you know, this is, this is a large scale, this is commercial, and because it's a commercial uh, business and it affects interstate commerce, um, but we also work at the request of the local law enforcement or state or county uh, law enforcement as well. So if it was a house and there were extenuating circumstances and we were requested by county, local or state law enforcement, we would certainly lend our assistance. Um, and, and we have a wide variety of uh, expertise uh, in this type of call out. Much ado about Hillary. Heat Street reported Hillary has been using pillows at every appearance to prop herself up, but it's truly the media spin cycle of her scandalous path of deviation in the face of the justice system that has propped up Hillary's presidential aspirations. How so, you ask? Because if Hillary's true criminal modus operandi was examined by a legitimate investigative media, the dead bodies stuck in Hillary's web would be front and center. And that trail of the dead is a long one. Vince Foster, Mary Mahoney, Judy Gibbs, Walter Scheib, Charles Ruff, Jim McDougal, Admiral Borda, Barry Seal, Michael Hastings, Sandy Hume, Gareth Williams are just a few of the ghosts in the Clintons' past. But now, fresh blood is being spilled with auspicious intentions regarding the Clinton campaign. June 22, 2016, UN official John Ash was murdered in a bizarre weightlifting incident while facing a trial for taking bribes from Clinton-tied Chinese billionaire David Ng. July 10th, 2016, Seth Rich, DNC voter expansion data director, was murdered in Washington, D.C. after possibly being tied to the massive email leak that upended the DNC. July 25th, 2016, former DNC chairman Joe Montano died of a supposed heart attack. August 1st, 2016, author Victor Thorne shot near his home after writing a slew of books exposing the Clinton crime family. August 2nd, 2016, Sean Lucas died mysteriously after serving a fraud class action suit against the Democratic Party. Poll numbers from Zogby Analytics now show that Hillary and Trump are neck and neck. Meanwhile, America's most trusted physician, Dr. Drew, raises legitimate concerns over Hillary's health. And based on the information that she has provided and her doctors have provided, we were gravely concerned not just about her health care, not about her health, but her health care. Why? Well, it's, it's hard for people to understand. Both of us concluded that if we were providing the care that she was receiving, we'd be ashamed to show up in the doctor's lounge. We'd be laughed out. It's... it's She's receiving sort of 1950-level sort of care by our evaluation. And Republicans in the House motioned to file perjury charges against Hillary after FBI Director James Comey contradicted Hillary's claims of innocence regarding the handling of classified material. There was nothing marked classified on my emails, either sent or received. Nothing was marked classified at the time I sent or received it. I think it's also important to say something about the marking of classified information. Only a very small number of the emails here containing classified information bore markings that indicated the presence of classified information. But even if information is not marked classified in an email, participants who know or should know that the subject matter is classified are still obligated to protect it. What he was very careful, of, the director Comey said that she didn't lie to them. But, you know, the public comments are one one area. But when you lie under oath, that's a whole nother level. And I was trying to get there because I wanted to know if that went towards her intent. However, these are the kind of pressures Hillary Clinton can endure. Because after decades of lying to Congress, it all begins to run together. In the very near future, once the smoke clears, Hillary Clinton's race to the halls of the hijacked corporatic throne of the United States will go down in history as the most bizarre political act of the 21st century. Who else will ever be able to match the amount of minor corruption that was used as cover by a bought and paid for media, ignoring the major crimes that threatened Hillary's political ambitions every step of the way? John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, can the 2016 election be rigged? Roger Stone says, you bet. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. 
You know, we've talked about election rigging, electronic manipulation ad nauseum here at InfoWars. Voter fraud itself, while not non-existent, as the left would tell you, is essentially more limited. The larger problem here uh, is election theft, the manipulation of what used to be known as the Diebold machines in common usage across the country. Now, if the Clintons would steal the election from Bernie Sanders, the nomination, as the DNC WikiLeaks proved they did, why would they not steal the election from Donald Trump if they can? Well, Stone says that voter fraud, specifically election fraud in this article, election theft through the manipulation of computerized voting machines is likely. Now, these diebold voting machines, they're widely used in most states. He talks about exactly how a computer hacker showed the CBS that voting multiple times by using a simple $15 electronic device bought at Best Buy could happen. Now, Stone cites a professor, Professor Fitrakis, poli-sci professor, he talks about this ad nauseum, and he goes into this article saying, here's the recipe how you publish a poll, a contrived number to suggest the result you're going to bring about. Then you manipulate the machine to bring about precisely the desired outcome. A mathematician and voting statistic expert that he also cites produced a very compelling study. I encourage you to take a look at this article in depth. By comparing polling to actual results and exit polls, it makes a compelling case for how the voting machine manipulation can occur. Now, we saw this happen. Hillary Clinton, we know, just looking at what she did with the nomination, taking it from Bernie Sanders, there was no way, you know, InfoWars, we were on the ground 70 to 1, we would find for Bernie Sanders, those supporters, we were so hard pressed to find a Hillary supporter anywhere. We know from those leaks that there was mass corruption on a large scale, that they were doing everything they could to secure the nomination for Hillary Clinton, and she took it. And Stone lays out this very compelling case that the 2016 election could be rigged in a similar way using these electronic machines. Now, the theft comes in with a computerized system that they know can be tripped up very easily. We've had experts here on InfoWars talking about this, experts like Bev Harris, and we've covered this. Now, Stone says that both parties engage in this. He's been with multiple presidential administrations, campaigns. He understands he's a Republican. He says Republicans do it as well as Democrats. Now, Stone goes on to cite the case of Wisconsin. He says that there was a strong indication that Scott Walker and Rince Priebus machine rigged as many as five elections, including the defeat of a Walker recall election. So we know that this is possible. And mathematicians and voting experts, they're saying that uh, by rolling out these absurd polls like Hillary Clinton ahead of the game when she can't even pack a stadium, uh, they're, they're setting us up for this type of machine manipulation. Now, one science, uh, political science professor who has been widely published, Paul Joseph Watson at InfoWars, he covered this. His name is Helmut Norpeth. He says that Trump has an 87 percent chance of winning this election. Now, this political science professor, he uses this election model. He's accurately predicted the outcome of a popular vote five times in a row. And he says that Trump has an overwhelming 87 percent chance of winning the presidency in the event that they don't try to steal it through these machine manipulation tactics. And uh, he appeared on, on Lou Jobs on Fox Business, and he, he laid forth his case. He says, I know that if you look at the polls right now, the polls are saying one thing, but polls and how people feel today at the at the election, uh, it's not more than two and a half months from now. And he's saying that people, he has enough pull behind him to take this overwhelmingly. Now, going back to what Stone said for a moment about the election theft and how easy it is to manipulate these, these machines, they were called diebold machines. And in my research, I was taking a look to try to find out which states are using them. And they've gotten such a bad rap that they've sold off a part of their company in order to change their name because the Diebold name is known for election theft. And it's really troubling that you can do this with a simple $15 Best Buy device. You know, this is something that dictators have known for decades. In fact, one of them, his words echoing from the grave, very troubling. 
Well, we know that we're living in a fake reality where Hillary Clinton uh, constructed data. This, this machine that she's operating with, this Soros machine, we know that he's funding her. We know that uh, Obama and Hillary, they've tried along with, with Soros to start a war with Russia. Uh, Soros, this leaked information from the DC leaks. We understand the underbelly of this machine. And we also understand that they're capable of rigging this election if they can't do it the old fashioned way, which is winning it. And uh, Stone highlights this well. And uh, as I pointed out, the, the election manipulation is on such a mass scale that the EU has actually banned these types of machines. They've gone back to an old fashioned way of doing things. And it remains to be seen. Can she pull it off? Can she successfully rig this? And we know that she's setting it up because the polls are so skewed. Every mainstream media is covering the fact that she's got this marginal lead. When if you really look at the numbers and the data, it just doesn't add up. Well, thank you for joining us. And if you're not a subscriber yet to PrisonPlanet.tv, be sure and sign up and join. You know, it helps us in this fight to continue this resistance, bringing you the truth. Be sure and join us tomorrow night for the nightly news, 7 p.m. sharp. I know I'll be here. I can't wait to see you. I'm Margaret Hell, reporting for Infowars.com.